Um, so I, uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight and thank you to Robert Fishman uh, for moderating this conversation. From He's a professor for, of urban planning and architecture at the University of Michigan. We're thrilled to have him moderate um, this and Marsha and Joe are both contributors to our book and Natasha and I are two out of the three edit, co-editors and co-designers. And we were just gonna, um, speak very briefly, kind of give an introduction. We're gonna basically have a kind of an open conversation, but we're just gonna give an introduction to Lafayette Park, um, just the sort of facts about, um, um, or some facts about Lafayette Park for, for, some, for those of you who maybe don't know everything about it. And we are fully aware that there are many people in the audience who know more about Lafayette Park than we do. Um, <laughs> but um, basically it's a 78-acre um, area east of downtown Detroit was the result of an urban, so-called urban renewal project completed in the early 1960s, and it was built on land that was once, um, once a neighborhood called Black Bottom, which was a, a working class neighborhood named Black Bottom for uh, the color of the soil, or we heard today the Blackfoot Indians who lived there once. Um, it was one of the few places in Detroit where African Americans could live due to the restrictive housing covenants at the time, and in the, late 40s, uh, early 50s, around 8,000 people were displaced, I think this is the number that I heard, and nearly all the structures were raised. The land sat empty for several years, and in 1956, Chicago developer Herbert Greenwald was brought in, um, and he brought Mies van der Rohe, um, the architect, to, to build structures and develop the land. So Mies van der Rohe is the man at the, with the pipe, or sorry, with the cigar, and he's sitting next to the man with the pipe, which is uh, who's uh, Herbert Greenwald. So Mies van der Rohe, sorry, yeah, uh, Mies van der Rohe brought uh, along Ludwig Hilbersheimer, the urban planner, and Alfred Caldwell, the landscape designer, and they designed um, the entire area. So it consists of a 13-acre park surrounded by high rise and high rises and low rise developments, a shopping center, and a school. Out of those, three of the high-rises and one of the low-rise developments were designed by Mies van der Rohe. Other architects were, built, were brought in to design the other buildings. Um, originally, it was supposed to be entirely designed by Mies van der Rohe, all of the buildings, but in 1959, Greenwald died in a plane crash, and without his energy, the original plan wasn't fully um, implemented. So we focused in our book on life in the Mies van der Rohe structures mainly because we needed to focus we needed to focus um, a bit. So here's another view of the park. So here you can see uh, in the background the Lafayette Towers. S so the, the townhouses, this is a view from above. Uh, this was shot from the pavilion building. The townhouses consist of 21 buildings, or the sort of Mies van der Rohe townhouses consist of 21 buildings. And then each of those buildings is divided into units. There are uh, single story units called the courthouses. There are 24 courthouses. And those have enclosed courtyards in the back. Um, and there are 162 townhouse units. And so here's an example of a building. This is actually shot from the back. So this is a building with, where you can see the 10 units, sort of the building divided into 10 units. Um, they're cooperatively owned. They tend to attract middle class residents, sort of a diverse group of young professionals, retirees, city employees, um, families with kids. Um, so here you can see the, this is the north end of the townhouses and they abutting the pavilion building. And the pavilion is one of the three high rises. There's the pavilion and uh, the Lafayette Towers the two Lafayette Towers. So the pavilion, or the high rises are rental apartments. The residents tend to be a little bit more transient than in the townhouses, although there's a contingent of longtime renters who have been there for, um, since the beginning of the, of the, or since the towers opened. The pavilion building has 340 apartments. Since, almost since it opened, it's, it, uh, it's been managed and owned by the Habitat Company, which is a Chicago-based company. It has around 95% occupancy. On the ground floor, there's a hair salon, a convenience store, a business center. They also have a pool, a fitness room. Um, and the Lafayette Towers, the twin Lafayette Towers were completed a little bit later. 
um, and they, there's the East Tower and the West Tower, and they, are, they, they share a management office in the East Tower. There are 584 apartments in there, and they, um, oops, they also have a, there's a pool between them on top, of, on top of a shopping structure, and they also have a fitness center, and they were owned by the same company that owns the pavilion now, by Habitat, um, up until 2008, and then they were bought by a New York-based company, the Northern Group, and there are people who might know a little bit more about these details than I do, but they, they've been kind of badly managed, or they were badly managed for sort of a four-year period, um, and they're now in foreclosure, um, and they're owned by the city of Detroit. So many people moved out, although we were just, we were just in the West Tower today, and um, somebody's apartment and there's you know still kind of a beautiful place to live but the they're looking for new owners um, so in yeah so so more specifically about the about the book we wanted to show the neighborhood from the inside out where uh, we focus on how people live in the neighborhood today um, how how residents interact with each other and how they live in this modernist setting um, most of the content for the book has been made specifically for the book, and all the contributions are by residents either present or past. Um, and the book is basically a documentation of, of um, how people live in Lafayette Park today. We're going to run, uh, we're, we're going to have images running in the background that um, are in the book, some of them are in the book, many are uh, process shots that we documented during our research, and some are things that just didn't make it to the book. And that was Joe Poche's apartment, the view from Joe Poche's apartment <laughs> a couple of minutes ago. Um, and these photos are by Corinne Vermeulen, by the way, who, who I don't think she's here tonight, but, but that's all we have prepared. So we'll turn it over to Rob, Robert Fishman. Okay, okay, well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, First of all, I want to say to, uh, to first of all, I want to say to Danielle, uh, and to, to Natasha, and to, to to Lana, to Lana as well. Thanks for the book. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's a really original book. And you know, before uh, turning turning the uh, evening over to Marsha and Joe and to the audience, I want to uh, indicate why I think it is so original. I want to start with a little story about a, a wonderful architect of today named Michael Piatok, who does affordable housing out of Oakland, Cal Oakland California. And he reached the stage in his life uh, where it was appropriate for him to publish a uh, set of his collected works, uh, usually a big coffee table type book of glossy images. Uh, but he told me, that what he want, wanted to do with that book uh, was to go around to all of his designs that had been built and to talk to the people who were living there and to get their experiences. And that would be, quote unquote, his book. And that I think was just, I mean, that's a wonderful idea. It's certainly not an idea that would have occurred to Mr. Meese, uh, <laughs> who is the exact opposite. Uh, but thanks to Danielle, Lana, and Natasha, they've in effect done it for him. <laughs> they've done that kind of, uh, they've done that kind of, uh, that kind of book. Uh, and it's one that I think we need particularly at this time. Uh, it occurred to me there's, a, there's an interesting ambiguity in the phrase, uh, thanks for the view, <laughs> that uh, they're referring, of course, first of all, to the view that uh, so many of, of the residents, so many of you have looking out. Uh, but it also could mean thanks for the, the view of people from the outside looking in. In other words, the image of Lafayette Park. And from first to last, the image has been overwhelming in terms of our understanding uh, of the place has overwhelmed the lived, uh, I think, the lived, the lived experience. At first, uh, during the era of urban renewal, the 1950s and 1960s, the image was overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly positive. This is the way that all of Detroit should be. Why do we need these pokey little streets and little bungalows and uh, uh, you know, subdivisions of the land and so on? What we need are super blocks and high-rise and uh, planning, 
on a, on a large scale. This was the new Detroit. Uh, so of course, how could you argue with the, how could you argue with the future? Uh, of course, since that time, uh, the image has undergone, uh, shall we say, a, a rather neg a negative transformation. And almost everything that seemed positive at first now seems, seems, seems negative. We've learned to valorize uh, the traditional streets, the traditional blocks, the sidewalks, the kind of uh, life and neighborly interaction that takes place in this more traditional setting to the degree that it's, uh, uh, it's taught or understood that you can't have a real community unless you have this kind of old-fashioned uh, old fashioned neighborhood. And you know, in, both, you know, in both cases, I think, we're, under, we're just not talking to the people who really have lived this and understand it from the, from the inside. And so, you know, I hope this evening that uh, we'll get beyond the image into the reality and, you know, address things like uh, what are, you know, what are the spaces in Lafayette Park that really work, that draw people together, that create, uh, that create community? What are the spaces that were designed to create community and, in fact, have failed from, uh, uh, from, from, day, from day one? Another, I think, very interesting theme that comes out very strongly in the book is the idea of transparency, that uh, Lafayette Park is almost too open, <laughs> too many <laughs> windows, uh, no, you know, no privacy. And that uh, uh, kind of contradicts, in a strange way, the idea that you know, a place like Lafayette Park, someplace so modernistic, is going to be uh, alienating with people isolated from each other uh, so that you have you know, both this extreme transparency and extreme separation. So how do the windows really work? <laughs> how does this openness actually, uh, actually, actually work? And finally, I think uh, maybe the most difficult but, but the most important question, which has to do with race. Uh, and as Danielle was mentioning, uh, Lafayette Park stands on the site of, you know, of the, the oldest, really, uh, the principal black ghetto uh, of, of Detroit, uh, black, black Bottom. Uh, it was very intentionally designed uh, as what was called urban renewal as Negro removal to get uh, black people away from the center where they were uh, 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 impacting, impacting business downtown and, uh, and so on. We know all this negative part, but there was a certain, insofar as there was any idealism in this, it, it came out of the idea that, you know, that we had to try something new. The old neighborhood designs had failed uh, we had to shake things up and create uh, a new pattern of living, a new physical pattern of living that just might lead to a more genuine integration, racial integration, uh, than, you know, than was possible in the, in the older neighborhoods. And again, this is a question, you know, we can, you know, bat it back and, around, back and forth uh, abstractly. This is a question of experience. And I think we have here, you know, we have on our panel two highly experienced and highly, uh, uh, highly thoughtful, as I know from their, from their, uh, their, their chapters in this, uh, in this book, uh, Marsha Music and Joe Posh. Uh, we'll start, I want to start with, with Marsha and just, in, just, intro, just introduce her briefly and say that uh, uh, she's kind of come full circle in the sense that she started off in Black Bottom uh, where her father, uh, Joe Von, Von Battle, uh, had a really influential and important record store and recording studio. She then moved to Highland Park and, uh, uh, and, you know, and finally has returned and lives in a townhouse in Lafayette Park. Uh, she, ha uh, she blogs as uh, uh, Marsha Music, A Grown Woman's Tales from Detroit. So, we'll be, so 
uh, I've asked her to respond to my questions, to her questions, in other words, to, uh, to give, her, you know, give us the basis of some, uh, the benefit of her experience. Uh, so perhaps you'd like me to summarize just a few things that you just raised a little bit. Yeah, if you could. Okay. Or, you know. I'm not sure I heard a question in there. Yeah, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay well, the question, you know, I will let, you know, if you don't mind, uh, if we could start with, you know, let's start with the toughest, uh, you know, which is the question of race. In other words, oh, a, how little, a little bitty question. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. In other words, have you found, you know, in other words, we know the cost of destroying Black Bottom. Uh, have you found in Lafayette Park uh, some measure of, you know, of, of a repayment for that? In other words, some measure of a new society, a better society, uh, in terms of race? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe that we do know the cost of the destruction of Black Bottom. Yeah, I don't you, know I if that it. has been or could be adequately categorized when you talk about the actual uh, demolition and destruction of not only an entire physical community, <clears throat> and this might be difficult to picture uh, in, in our time today, but you're looking at a community that went more or less from Gratiot almost to the river, basically, uh, and had very you know, large boundaries the other way and its uh, ancillary neighborhoods that were around it. The cost of the destruction itself, I believe, is extremely profound, Mr. Fishman, and, and I believe that it ripples through the city of Detroit today, and I don't believe that uh, Detroit has ever truly recovered from the destruction of Black Bottom, because I think that destruction uh, eliminated a certain level of what might be called generational wealth that had begun to accumulate, uh, a business class that had uh, begun to coalesce on the streets there, African American businesses, and in some ways uh, a lot of this cannot be recovered. The physical destruction of the community as far as the realignment of the streets, uh, sometimes my husband who is new to Detroit comments on the sort of circuitous and bizarre cutting offs of streets in the, in the area. And a lot of that comes from the way that uh, Black Bottom was sort of chopped up. Just, just to uh, uh, go backward a little bit, uh, I, I was born in Detroit and my father uh, shortly after I, uh, I was a toddler moved us to Highland Park, uh, his family. My father was a, a, a very successful a record producer and uh, on Hastings Street. And Hastings Street was demolished uh, as a part of this entire demolition. And it was demolished. And I remember uh, standing on the banks of that massive crevasse as a little girl, probably five or six years old, and looking down upon that crevasse, which was really mountainous, particularly as a child. And my father's poignant statement to me at that time in which he stood there with me and I suppose maybe held my hand to keep me from toppling off into it. And he said to me, baby, this used to be Hastings Street. And the defeat of that and the angst of that was so great, I have never forgot it in all of these years, uh, his statement about not only what it had done to him as a businessman, but to the entire community that was wiped out and, and forced to move elsewhere. Now, uh, that being said, I have also, this, my conversation in the book arose from initial discussions that I had with the editor at my home in which they were fumbling around trying to figure out what they were going to say about this community. Uh, I was very clear that they did not bring any of the baggage that I associated with uh, many young whites that come into the city. Uh, they didn't have any of the uh, generational hostilities. Uh, they didn't have any of the suburban uh, venom that is vented against the city of Detroit. And uh, I, I, was very, I was very struck by that. And it, I suppose it caused me to speak 
very, very, very honestly with them about my feelings. And that is where this piece that I wrote came from, uh, in which as I began to write, I believe, Mr. Fishman, that I began to come in the process of the writing to a certain resolution of the, uh, the destruction of Black Bottom with this phoenix of Lafayette Park which arose from it. Uh, because I began to realize that in my writing about the certain idyllic way that we live in Lafayette Park, you know, a lot of people do regard it as rather idyllic there, particularly in the townhouse community. Uh, we have a certain kind of problems. We have problems just like every neighborhood, but um, there is a certain bucolic beauty that it, about living there that is very uh, singular. But I began to realize the peacefulness of this neighborhood may have had more to do with not just <coughs> having security patrols, being neighborly, all this kind of stuff. But I knew that in my heart, spiritually, that there was a connection between that destruction of that neighborhood, on that land, on that black loam that exists there that is so fertile, that my father and grandmothers and people before me had tried to uh, make a living and make the way out of no way. Uh, I knew that there was a connection between them and those of us there now. And I believed that, and, I, and as I wrote, that the destruction of that community um, and, and our peacefulness now may have had something to do with a certain amount of grace that has been given by those souls that were forced out of that community, a certain amount of recompense for, uh, for such an overwhelming uh, routing of these people out of the community. And sometimes uh, in life, one finds situations and one just experiences grace. And I believe that Lafayette Park has experienced grace, uh, a, a sort of bequeathing of grace from those old souls that were there uh, that has allowed this community to live in peace in, to a certain degree. And that's how I came to a certain resolution of those things. There is a certain kind of what one might call, what I call, a, a cultivated neighborliness. Yeah. You know, we're sort of purposefully neighbor, neighborly, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, we, 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 we construct certain neighborly situations in order to compel us to interact with one another. And, uh, but that is because, in my opinion, and I will close, um, this community exists as a community of people who have chosen to live together uh, and have chosen an integrated situation as much as can be said as integration in Detroit. And this is the most segregated community in the United States. So to make decisions to stay in, a, in an integrated situation is, is, very, is very striking. Uh, as opposed to many people who are moving into the city now, who I characterize as people who want a Detroit sans Detroiters. <laughs> and, uh, and that's something that I notice all the time. The creation of enclaves that really don't include Detroiters. Uh, so it, that being said, perhaps I've answered a little bit yeah, of what you asked. Yeah, well, thank you, Marcia, for <laughs> thank a, you. a really uh, eloquent statement. Pleasure. And uh, I'd like to turn to to, uh, to Joe Posh now, and just to just to re, uh, <laughs> so you can laugh a little just bit. Just to in, after all that. <laughs> just to introduce him. Uh, 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 he's a, a Detroit entrepreneur. Uh, he's been, was the proprietor of the design school Mezzanine. Uh, and also of, of Detroit's first pop-up store, uh, You. He blogs uh, uh, as, uh, under the title Super Gay Detroit. <laughs> and uh, I, guess, I, guess my, I guess I would say, you know, you're, I, I haven't met you. You sound like a pretty hip guy. Uh, and He's a pretty hip guy. And, uh, you know, your chapter in the book is a, you know, is a flat-out defense and of, you know, of, of, I wouldn't say of the whole thing, but you really want to see it preserve, you know, you, you, you want to see it, you know, you want to see the spirit of the place, the details of the place uh, preserved by management. 
So, uh, as I say, Lafayette, the, the design philosophy of Lafayette Park isn't all that hip right now. <laughs> so I was wondering how you, you know, in other words, how you, how you see, you know, how you see the place. And I should say that you, you lived in the West Tower uh, right. from 2006 to 2010. That's right. Well, um, I think, to me, the, um, the, and, the, and, the, and I want to kind of preface what I'm going to talk about with saying that life in the townhouses, I think, is, is extraordinarily different than life in the towers. Um, life in the towers is, there is a lot more turnover of people. People do tend to stay to themselves a little bit more, although you certainly do meet people in your, in your building, especially your neighbors. But it isn't, it isn't to the extent of what you see in the townhouses. Mm -hmm. The windows in the apartments are all, they all face outward and you have nobody, for the most part, nobody looking in. It's the most kind of transparent privacy <laughs> that you would ever experience. I was on the 15th floor. I had a northwest uh, corner apartment um, overlooking the, uh, the park um, so I could see, I basically had a view from uh, the Renaissance Center all the way across uh, Eastern Market. It is, um, but you know, unless it was warm, I never really had to worry about anybody seeing in unless there was somebody in the pavilion with a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> because it was, uh, you know, you're up there and I mean, literally birds, you sit, you're sitting in, on your sofa and birds like fly by. So it's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very private experience living in the towers. And I think that but I think as, as far as apartment living goes, uh, certainly in Detroit, there are, um, there are only a handful of tower, of high-rise options um, that I think that are kind of accessible to, to most people. Um, there are, um, and of the ones that are there, the, I think that the, 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 what makes the Mies van der Rohe towers, and I can't really speak to the pavilion specifically, because I never lived in there, I've been in there, but I'm certainly partial to the, to the, to the two towers, the East and West Tower. Yeah. The, um, and I, I can explain that in a second. Because <laughs> I just feel like Marsha has binoculars. <laughs> but it's, um, it's really, uh, it's, um, it's one of those things where you, you go in and literally the view over, and they showed the view from my apartment, um, just a little while ago, the view is really, really breathtaking. And it is, it's the type of thing where you, when you live in there, like I got rid of television. Mm. Um, you know, I literally just listened to music or, and I work from home a lot. And, uh, but my desk faced out over the park and um, at night, the, the skyline is beautiful. It's literally like a view, it's comparable to Central Park West, like looking out over the park. It's, inc it's incredible. And it's incredibly undervalued. And, um, but, you know, I can say that now when it's in, like, HUD owns it and nobody's <laughs> raising the rent. But it's, it is, um, it's one of those things that where you move in and you don't start realizing the details until you've spent a little time in there. And I was, of course, familiar, um, you know, I had, I had a, a store that specialized in modern design since the late 90s. And I moved it from Ann Arbor to Detroit in 2006. And that's when I got my apartment in, um, in uh, the towers and it was um you know i thought i would check it out because it was a Mies building and it was the view is really what kept me there the apartments themselves you know it depends how much of a purist you are some of them have been updated some of them haven't they all have carpeting now which isn't a really great carpeting and it's um so there are certain certain things about it that you know you might have to overlook if you wanted to live there but the more time you spend there, the more time you realize that the attention to details that they always talk about with Mies van der Rohe are really, really present. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, the, it's a, the type of thing like a, an accordion, like a bifold closet door, like right as you open your door to your apartment, that opens up just enough so there's still clearance for the mm -hmm. front door. Mm -hmm. It's a, a door in your bathroom, a column of the building, like a support column for the building, mm -hmm. kind of a, takes up part of the, the bathroom. You open the bathroom door, the column and the door like meet perfectly at the end. <laughs> um, in the bedroom, I remember one time I was talking on the phone and laying on the floor and just looking at the ceiling, and I realized that on the other side of the hallway, the other column was um, 
match the door perfectly on that side too. It's it's weird, and <laughs> it is. Um, you know, maybe I don't know if most people know this, but it really is one of those things that the more you start to notice the details, the more you start to appreciate the thought and precision mm -hmm. and everything in mm -hmm. these spaces. And that's I know that's true. the same in the townhouses too. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as living there, it is um, the one thing that you have to do in, um, and the one thing that's out of your control is um, you have to walk from your car up to your apartment or walk from, I used to walk to work most days, and so walk from work, you have to walk from the front door up to your apartment every day. And in, and this sort of where my piece in the book came from was when I moved in, Lafayette Towers felt like, a, it wasn't priced like a luxury place to live, but it felt like a luxury apartment building. The landscaping was beautiful, the lobby was spotless, there were plants, they had a door person, um, people were friendly for the most part, and uh, occasionally an elevator didn't work, but everybody who lived there was very, it seemed respectful of the fact that they lived in a nice place. Um, when the Northern Group took over the building, um, they, uh, they bought the building, I believe, for something in the neighborhood of, they bought the two buildings, and this is a stab in the dark based on something I heard at one point. But I think they bought the buildings for about 12 million, and then they subsequently took out a $28 million uh, HUD mortgage on the buildings. The, um, and then proceeded to put a little bit of money into it. They put money into redoing the laundry room, which needed it. Um, they put money into the elevators, but they never paid the elevator vendor. So you would always have these issues where now there were new elevators, and you, but they didn't work all the time, which was the same as before, except now they were supposed to be working. At the same time, they had they skimped on management. They um, they didn't. Uh, they it was a, a rotating door of management companies, mm -hmm. and what happened is you all of a sudden you had um, plants no notice when there would be things like water being out, or they wouldn't turn the heat on until late, which was a chronic problem in all their buildings. They also bought the Penobscot building, they bought the uh, First National building, which is now owned by Quicken Loans. They bought Cadillac Tower and um, one other apartment building um, down in Indian Village. But it is, uh, they were notorious for not turning on the heat. Um, it was, um, and, and, then it, and then it was just tiny aesthetic insults every day. <laughs> it was a sign taped to like the door in duct tape saying like they were gonna be, elevators were out of service. It was um, replacing the marble and stainless steel like door person's podium with like a, like an office depot, like f off, like wood Drip. laminate. Drip. Yeah, just like <laughs> terrible. And uh, it was replacing a door person with like a rent -a -cop. It was. <laughs> You know, it was one of those things where it's just like you just could feel. It was they stopped doing outdoor landscaping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and most significantly, it turned into the leasing office seemed to turn to, it was like they were trying to rent um, apartments in Clinton Township and not in like what realistically is one of Detroit's flagship apartment communities. And, you know, it was like the bad banners outside, which are there to this day. You can drive by tomorrow. They're horrible. And, um, the, uh, and then they, they put all these like logo banners on the outside of the building and then they painted the planners, which really created a ruckus. Um, the planners were originally black, like all the planters around the outside, whoops. And um, then they painted them what I can only call Honolulu blue, the lion's blue. And one day it was all of a sudden they were blue. And um, you know, while I'm sitting there going, what? Apparently um, people over in the townhouses had like converged and descended <laughs> on the management office. And uh, so they were painted, repainted white a few days later. But it's, um, but you know, the problem with an apartment is that the, the, the tenants aren't, you know, they're not owners. And uh, you really only have a limited, limited amount of control. And if you don't like it, then you can leave. And that's exactly what happened. Um, like many, many, many long-term uh, tenants. I had so many conversations with people um, who decided they just couldn't deal with how it was being run as a second rate, third rate, fourth rate building. And um, their, none of their concerns were ever addressed, tenant meetings, nothing ever came out of them because the management was not responsive. And um, I remember the day I moved out, it was, um, there were, and, and this is, and it seemed like they were really just trying to get fit, like the lowest, 
like common denominator tenant, like who's gonna rent a studio? That's like what they seem to be going for. They didn't, weren't concerned about keeping their one and two bedroom tenants. They weren't concerned about getting one and two bedroom tenants, it seemed. It was, um, it was the people who cared about living in a building that was nice. And you know, if you read the book, which I, you know, I highly recommend because there are so many great stories in there, it's a diverse economically, it's diverse racially, it's diverse like age-wise, like it's a really, it was a really great population. I'm, you know, I haven't lived there in two years, so I don't know what, exactly what it's like now. I expect it's predominantly the same. But it was a lot of people who had an expectation that just because we're living someplace that is affordable and just because we're living someplace that's close to downtown doesn't mean that we have to have this, we have, it has to be like junky. And that's a problem we have in Detroit in general. Like, I think people really let their standards slip because at least somebody's doing something. You know, people say that all the time. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that you have to hold people to a little bit of a standard. And uh, it, was, it, got, it got really disappointing. And when I closed up um, my store in Mezzanine and when I closed up my, the pop-up store I did Hue, um, back in 2010, I decided I was going to um, move out, which was sad because it was really the greatest place I'd lived. But I was just so annoyed every day. Um, when I walked in, I, by the time I got to my apartment, I'd be like literally angry. And um, so it is um, a lot of the, the pavilion filled up. The pavilion went to like 100% occupancy for a while. Everybody was leaving the, the tower. The pavilion. Yeah, yeah. And um, the day I moved out, it was, um, I was talking to a few other people, and it was the same, day, we were all moving out at the same time. And it was like a young white couple, like maybe 30s. Me, like 40-year-old gay guy, and like maybe a 50-year-old black woman. And we all sat there and waiting for the elevator, saying, you know, it's a real shame. And it really was a shame. So now, the way things stand, the uh, city of Detroit is poised to take possession of the building. The deal is they're going to try and find a developer. They apparently have three different developers with a laundry list of improvements, about $12 million in improvements that must be made. Um, uh, by, they'll have to contractually agree to that. I believe two that they are talking to are from out of state and one is local. And um, the good news is that um, the city gets what, this build, what these buildings are and they really want to make sure it goes to somebody who is not going to repeat the problem that we had with Northern Group when they took that over and really kind of, you know, just kind of trashed it, treated it like an out of town landlord, which is exactly what they were and it's what Detroit has too many of. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, Joe. And uh, before before we uh, uh, before I, before I uh, uh, throw, <clears throat> open the floor to the uh, to the audience, and I'm sure you have a lot of a lot of a lot of good questions and points for for Joe and Marsha. I would just ask you, you know, I don't know if you want to uh, p pick up on this. I mean, is La was Lafayette Park is Lafayette Park in your experience a neighborhood? <laughs> A community, in other words, are there places where people really do, you know, you have a diverse population, yes, but are there places where people really communicate and interact? <laughs> or is it just, you know, a whole lot of diverse people coming and going? Is that question for Marsha or for me? Either one, either one, either, if either you want to grab it or, you know, if, if not, right, there's probably somebody well, in the well, audience well, I who think, would. I think, I think you should answer that, but I also want to just make clear for people who are not familiar with the area, Joe is talking about a, a completely different subset of, uh, of buildings than where I live in the townhouses. Uh, he's talking about the Twin Towers, which are high-rise buildings yeah, in Lafayette Park. You. He's also referenced the Pavilion, which is a high-rise <coughs> in Lafayette Park. And then we have a whole other community of townhouse dwellers uh, that are in that community, who I would say are probably uh, neighbors in a sense, but you also have a number of uh, 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 splits between these people, you know, because you also have class divisions that exist in the community between the apartment dwellers of the towers and the townhouse residents that does exist. Uh, you have uh, a certain level of uh, distancing that takes place between the people who live in the Mies uh, development and those who live in the outlying uh, Sherbino, uh, Shadow yeah. Fort, those areas there uh, that are so, uh, sometimes regarded, and there are rental apartments and co-ops over there 
that are never regarded with the same cachet in some respects as the townhouse community. So you have a number of, of, of uh, schisms in there, you know. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the, I mean, with the towers and being a community, I think there was, it really is, if you wanted to get involved, you could. Like there, there was a tenants group, which I did not engage in a, a great deal. Um, I did get to know a lot of people in the towers. Um, you meet people in the uh, elevator and, uh, you know, I knew everybody who lived around me on my floor. And um, I have other friends who, you know, lived in the towers and we would see them. But it's, um, you know, I, again, I think compared to what happens in the, uh, I actually probably hung out more with people, you know, I have a lot of friends who live in the townhouses. I have friends who live in uh, Shadow Fort. Um, you know, I probably hung out more with people in those other co-ops than I did with the people who were renters in the apartments other than the people I knew going in already. But we have, I mean, as far as like neighborhood activities, I think um, there are definitely moments of, there, there are definitely moments where I think neighbors intentionally activate certain spaces. You know, I mean, just to sort of speak directly to your, to your yeah. question, because I think one of the areas that I think um, seems underutilized, but is still utilized is the is the 13-acre park between the. I mean, I don't know if you guys have that impression too, but the the park that sits between the um, twin towers and the or the Lafayette towers and the townhouses and the pavilion. Um, like there was occasionally you'll see sort of a barbecue, like a big party happening there, but a lot of the times it's mostly dog walk, like people walking dogs and and sort of. Um, letting them run. But then in the townhouses, um, the meadow is sort of this in very kind of interior grassy area between two of the townhouse buildings. And there have been, there's a, there's like annual um, picnics for everybody in the co-op, like a potluck picnic, um, the Meester egg hunt that was coined by um, Noah Resnick and Melissa Dimmer, I think, for kids, and like a Halloween like a Halloween party where it's called a Meester egg hunt. Yeah, the Meester. Yeah, yeah, the Meester egg hunt. That wasn't. That was. Yeah. So um, and then, but then also, I, I rented a studio in the pavilion for for several years, and th there are a lot of kind of resident activities that happen there too. Like you know, sort of more than the towers. Definitely I also live in the towers, but as far as community goes, the the pavilion has a lot more going on than the towers. Yeah, there's just a really nice vibe in there. However, I just want to also say we were we were in the West Tower today visiting Matt Piper, who's in the audience, or one of the and 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 um, who's seems to be having a fabulous life in the towers, so we don't want to make it sound like it's oh, all no, kind no. of... The, the, yeah. the, they're apparently, the, I mean, from, from what I understand right now, the management is very capable. It's yeah. what, it, what, we, what needs to happen is an owner needs to take it and make the improvements that need to happen to the building just to, there are some like, you know, like actual infrastructure improvements that need to be made. Yeah. And, um, and then certainly, you know, they could plant a flower or two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so there are uh, questions, comments uh, from, uh, from the floor? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, um, I was wondering about, you know, there's a number of projects like this where, where um, buildings are designed to be built in the I mean, yeah. I have a certain feeling, and, 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 and Joe has carved out a niche of really being um, a spokesperson for the integrity of those high-rise buildings. Uh, but just based on my empirical knowledge, I believe that to some degree that there is a certain kind of uh, view 
of the buildings, particularly the towers, and I'm, I'm gonna make sure I'm trying to answer your question, but there's a certain view of the, particularly the two towers, uh, particularly because they are occupied by mostly African Americans. And I believe that this has contributed to the lack of uh, investment and integrity and the view of those buildings by these various owners over the last period of time. That to some degree, they do not, they're not regarded as deserving uh, mm -hmm. of the cachet that they do have just because of who lives there. I totally agree with mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so that, that is an element. Um, but I don't know if that's specifically answering your question. Uh, the different buildings uh, have, have different designers in, in that, but I think as a whole, those buildings are regarded of a piece. Even 1300, the co-op across Lafayette from it. They're all regarded of a piece and are sort of regarded uh, with the same kind of respect in a lot of ways, but the towers have really struggled over the last years. And, I, and I'm convinced that that has something to do with it, the racial aspect. I think that what Marcia says is, um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty much true. What happened was you had somebody who was not familiar with Detroit who mm -hmm. bought a Detroit, mm -hmm. what we consider an iconic building, what they considered a real estate bargain. Yes. And they looked at ways that they could pull as much money out of it as possible because who cares, it's Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. Like we can run yeah. it into the ground and, um, and then, uh, you know, and then when we're done, we'll turn it back over to HUD, who took a bath on it. Like, I mean, seriously, they bought it at the real estate peak for a song anyway, and then they mortgaged it to the hilt, and then they invested, you know, a fraction of what they took out of it, and then they let it go to foreclosure. I mean, frankly, they should be prosecuted for fraud. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, but you know, they did that all over Detroit. And, um, and I do absolutely think that it is, the view was, it's just Detroit, and you know what? The, and the towers are predominantly African American, and I think that um, they were like, who's gonna care? I mean, I don't know if that was a conscious thought, but I certainly, I think that was the effect of it. I, I'd, like, I'd like to add to that, um, and, 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 I, and even given my remarks, because these are certain things that have not been publicly talked about uh, when it comes to the Mies van der Rohe de development. Uh, and so I have a certain urge to want to express and articulate some of these things. Uh, but do not regard the heaviosity of my remarks to influence you regarding the, 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 the levity that is actually in this book. Because this book is actually very wonderful and it's very funny. And uh, there's, there's a lot of very bright and whimsical uh, aspects of the book. But I, I want to say this uh, because it's connected. One of the things that I uh, began in my kind of opus that I did here because it didn't start out to be as lengthy as it turned out to be but I they they, they gave me carte blanche to Marsha just get it all out and 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 I did that and one of the things that began to evolve in my thinking uh, was the concept of invisibility as it relates to Detroit architecture to the culture of Detroit and to Lafayette Park in particular, because many whites in particular who come to live in Lafayette Park in the townhouses particularly, or even in the high rises, are really stunned that nobody really appreciates the, the design provenance of this community, the significance of it, uh, it is not reflected in very high real estate values uh, relative to, the, to uh, generally internationally what something like this would command. And I began to really look at the fact that because of the fact that these particular Mies van der Rohe um, structures or this installation, if you would like to call it that in an artistic sense, uh, they are, because uh, they are in Detroit and because African Americans live there, although uh, the townhouse community is not majority African American, but perhaps the community as a whole might be, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, but because African Americans are a, a, an, an intrinsic part of this community, I believe that the community has become invisible because of that. And this is something that African Americans generally are familiar with, uh, a situation in which whatever we are in becomes invisible unless it's regarding mayhem or murder or negativism. 
Uh, and here we are all living together, and it's wonderful, and it's a great place to live, and nobody sees it. So the invisibility of the, uh, the title of my article is called Hidden in Plain Sight. It's relative to not only the glass enclosures of the physical structures, not only the uh, fauna and flora that surrounds the buildings and makes it somewhat obscure, not only the fact that it is in a relatively obscure, nondescript uh, corner of a, of a freeway service drive in a city street, <laughs> But also this fact that a certain cloak of invisibility has been uh, laid upon this community that, that's, that's called, you know, living with black people. And, and I want to say this because we're, we're seeing this more. Uh, I, I got tickled when I saw uh, this, the, the hue and cry uh, about uh, Stephen Colbert and how uh, everyone's in an uproar about uh, this uh, comedian who has uh, refused to, uh, oh, he said some disparaging things about, you know, there's nobody in the city of Detroit, you can walk down the city of Detroit, and there's quite a campaign going on, uh, uh, online campaign going on about people who are raising their, raising their hackles about, you know, we want Stephen Colbert to come here and <laughs> see what we're doing in Detroit. And, and it tickled me because to a degree, it's like now you're seeing what it's like to be invisible because now you are in Detroit and the cloak has been placed over you to a certain degree. And so you're going to experience being unseen no matter what your efforts are, no matter what the positive things you're doing, this is going to be, this is going to afflict uh, people, just the, the issue of invisibility. Uh, and that's another thing that I deal with in the book. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just sort of, I thought that was a good question, what he asked, you mm -hmm. know, and I wanted to sort of try to just acknowledge at least some of the other communities around the park because um, there's shadow for it. I, I, we actually listed the names, we, we know the names of the architects, I don't know them off the top of my head, mm -hmm. although I'm sure people in the audience do, but there's um, shadow for it and Park Lafayette, which is um, sort of at the northeast end, and then the Windsor Tower, which I think was a retirement home for a while and then was, is now mm -hmm. rental apartments. And the 1300 building at the south end is sort of a fam famously designed building to Gunnar, Gunnar Burkitts. Bur Bur um, and that's you know a great building. And, I, and um, Shadow for it, I already said Shadow for it, I think. But I think that um, I often wonder that too, because originally the all of the buildings were supposed to be Mies van der Rohe buildings. And I kind of wonder how much this affects, or, well, right. Like how, well, the, uh, well how one thing the, uh, that's clear is that uh, the uh, apartment building that is, I believe, income, income, uh, income rental, subsidized, subsidized, subsidized uh, apartments yeah. uh, at the north end the of the Windsor park. Tower, yeah. uh, it has a new name now. I don't remember the name of it. It is never regarded as part of Lafayette Park. Right, right, And, right. and that's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about as far as some of the class schisms that exist mm -hmm. uh, in the community. Yeah, I think you're right. The, um, and just to kind of throw in, you know, my two cents on that. I think one of the things that has happened in the last several years, and this is something that when, um, when I first moved to Detroit in 2006 um, and went in, what, you know, somebody asked me, well, I moved into Lafayette Towers because of the view really is why I moved in. And it was, um, you know, I was checking it out. I had, I had other ideas about where I might live. And um, I think that what happened is, well, we have what, you know, I, I mean, I guess I call it the Dwell Magazine generation kind of came of age. And it was people who, like, finally got to the young people who were paying attention to design, finally got to the point where they could buy someplace to live. And all of a sudden, the, the Mies pedigree met something really significant. Um, but in the, um, but, you know, the, the townhouses and the, t and the towers and the pavilion have been, like, occupied forever. And really what they were was just, like, a, a good place to live. And, I, and a lot of people, especially in the towers, don't really pay attention to the pedigree. They live there because they love the view. It's close to downtown, like, really close to downtown. And um, it's easy to get in and off with the freeway if you have to go someplace. I mean, there are a million things about it that are really mm -hmm. great. The lead, and fr from a, on a day-to-day -day living point of view, the Mies pedigree, I think, at this point is, um, is incidental. Mm -hmm. I think that you will continue to see people. I think, you know, you look at what's happening downtown. The minute that those apartments, like, look pretty enough, you're going to see a lot of, like, Gilbertville moving in, like a lot of those live downtown incentives, which, you know, fine. But um, it's... Um, 
you know, it, it's because it's 500 great units, like walking distance to downtown. And, um, you know, you hope that it doesn't change the character of what's going on. And I mean, and again, I'm only speaking to the towers because that's that was my place. Um, you know, it's, you know, if someone's going to put a party deck somewhere on the pool or do something real, like kind of D-baggy, like, you know, that is, you know, it's common. I know everyone here laughs. It's common. And um, it's one of those things where you're just like, sometimes it being hidden in plain sight is a good thing. Is a good thing. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think that's one of the reasons why I characterize some of our uh, neighborliness as a certain cultivated neighborliness. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I'm saying that. It's a sort of uh, 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 a conscious effort to try mm -hmm. to be neighborly, despite the fact that we know that these different attitudes are there and these different uh, uh, viewpoints uh, that people have, and, and that underneath, you know, you still have the same kind of conflicts that you're talking about that are there, and you're absolutely right. Um, one, of, uh, one of my Facebook friends, uh, a young lady who is uh, very active in the rebuilding of Detroit type of movement, you know, she, uh, African-American, and uh, she's just uh, devastated because she lives in the pavilion. Mm -hmm. And she said that she got a notice of a rent increase of, uh, mm -hmm. I think, almost $80 a month. You know, and for a young single person in an apartment, that's a big jump. And, uh, and of course, the issue of gentrification becomes in uh, the whole um, sea change of uh, property owners and uh, people in the community. Uh, so these are very, very real issues, but I think that there are things like this that are fleshing out some of these things. And that's why I was very grateful to the editors for allowing me to write flat out uh, what I felt that I needed to say about all of these issues. Okay. I mean, okay, well, yeah, but it's uh, also, it's also, it's just, I also feel like what, the way Marsha talked about everything is also sort of was incredibly articulate and also sort of very important, but I think, you know, and I think um, just as sort of like a side thing, but one of the things that also sur sort of I found interesting and in sort of delving into the archives and looking through, this is a picture actually of a neighbor, Betty Brown, who's lived in the townhouses since the late six, or since the 60s, she had a lot of newsletters. And there's talk throughout the years of people talking about living in this interracial, multicultural neighborhood. Like, like there was kind of, there's a kind of intentionality where it's like, yes. we're trying to do this. We're trying we're gonna, to do this. We're mm -hmm. going to hang out together. But you, you know, sometimes it's forced, maybe, mm -hmm. but, you, mm -hmm. but you work at it. Um, but I think mm -hmm. you're, you know, what you say, it's sort of, it's depressing, but I think it's, yeah, it's sort of, yeah. absolutely. Okay, well, we're, we're running out of time, but uh, I, I think we have time for just one, yeah, one more one question. Our yeah, right there. yeah, is it a question in the back? Yeah. 
bikes. You mean it's, it's like a parallel neighborhood to what I grew up being used to. And I will say that over the years, I have had to be very defensive about living in Detroit with my work associates and my suburban neighbors. And I will also say that probably the people that have lived down there all those years with me could have lived almost anywhere else they have chosen. Okay, well, well that, thank you. That's a wonderful clo closing. And uh, I just, I just, we could, we could, if, if, if I think if the audience would like to talk a little bit longer, we could also go a little bit longer. I don't know how people, okay. how people feel out there or feel over here. Okay, sure, anybody, sure. Or, yeah. self-containment of the neighborhood in a yeah. certain respect, yes. It has that in Detroit, but in other cities it would be considered a negative, I feel. I mean, I, I think, I mean, there are a lot of advantages, I think, to that. Just, I mean, partially is that, it, you know, it's quiet, especially now that there's, you know, there's stadiums so close by, and, and uh, but you, you have Eastern Market at your footstep, uh, like at your doorstep. You've got uh, the waterfront, the riverfront right there. I mean, there are a lot of things, but yeah, and, but I think, you know, I don't think that is, I don't think it's incorrect to say that the sort of self-contained nature of Lafayette Park is also something that helped kind of preserve it. Obviously, it's the, the people who live there ultimately that do, but it's because it is able to be tight-knit when it needs to be tight-knit that I think it uh, has avoided some of the problems that some of the other nearby east side neighborhoods have, have uh, really succumbed to. I mean, there are great, um, and I, I would like to throw this out, there are some other really great co-ops just on the other side of the Dequinter Cut. Um, town Square. Yeah, Town Square. Town Square is very good. And um, Hyde Park, I call it like mm -hmm. an urban Narnia. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> like, there are a lot of other really great ones over there, too. <laughs> Hi, Sue. Good to see you. Um, and, and they sort of benefit from that same sort of, like, community. It's weird because it really is. I have an ad. I picked up an old monitor. The, it's a, the downtown newspaper with it has apartment ads and stuff. And um, I found an old one from like 1988, and it was like Lafayette Tower is like a suburb in the city. And um, but you know that's it, it's a, those all of those new uh, all of those developments have a, a bit of a suburban aspect to them, but they're they're really close to downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that takes a level of planning and foresight that we have not seen in the city of Detroit uh, in my lifetime. And I don't know that that would be necessarily to the benefit of the neighborhood. No, I think it's... Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I just never thought about that. I, I, I do note that uh, be nicer for they're, the gonna, they're going to run the DeQuinder cut uh, to, you know, further through. 
mm -hmm. onto Gratian, across Gratian in some way. Uh, but I had never thought of the community as a whole uh, being expanded outward that way. I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 yes. I do understand what you're saying there. That's like one of my wishful thinking things, you On know. On the pedestrian level, it'd be really fantastic. <laughs> it's hard, you know, that, that uh, I think it's the creamery there, Strolls, mm -hmm. that's there, and it just blocks everything off. But it also does bespeak all of those streets cut off, like I was talking about, that sort of chaotic uh, cutting off that took place when the neighborhood was destroyed. You know, it just, everything just got, bam, cut off in a kind of weird way so that there's some odd ingress and egress around the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're a little dead Yeah, somebody yeah. here? Yeah, yeah, please. So I think it's the question is like, would you want to take down that wall actually? Because I mean, it's a pain when you're driving and you have to go all the way around and then come back around, mm -hmm. like, or you know, especially when you're sort of yeah, it's, you're, it's when you're pain. right next door, you're especially right when there. you're yeah. really there. But but yeah. then it kind of but then it really makes you think maybe I should just walk to Easter Market. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it takes so much longer. Yeah. You, you had a guy there, and then you want to yeah. break it up? Yeah, yeah please. Hi, um, I have lived in Market Towers for about. Four years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just kind of want to attest to the fact that I am having a really awesome time in Lock at Dowers and on the line. And that actually, um, I think that probably one of the saddest parts about the towers is my, maybe just planning, actually. Um, certain things that Ms. Vander did were wonderful, and that the landscape architect and the planners did were wonderful. But then there are certain things that you think. Well, we're living on a park. There's no door on the park. Mm -hmm. uh, we're living in ponds for people in Lafayette, uh, you know, in the, in the townhouses. But if I want to get to you, look out. I have no path directly to you. I have to wrap around this lake, you know, that's between mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So the word separation is really important mm -hmm. in the neighborhood because whether it be because it hasn't been finished or whether it be because of just, you know, frankly, after time has gone on poor planning, we don't have that kind of access. We really are on the outskirts. The way our buildings would be face one another, but we have to walk away from the car to get anywhere we're walking out. Uh, I feel like a building these days is built on a park like this would have park access. Yes, you know? yes. I think that there are all these desire paths too. I mean, I'm the yeah. kind of person who wants to use the so I see the fact that there is this desire path where everyone I think I think that the <laughs> towers in that. particular, the towers in particular, were a, a particularly car-oriented development. I mean, the, as you guys know, there used to be a, a gas station out just right in the. Yeah, right at the foot of the, uh, uh, right when you entered the, the parking structure. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, the idea, I think, was that you, they probably, God knows, they probably had valet parking. Like, you know, you like pull up, boom, gone. And, um, but you know, I have heard rumblings, and I don't, and maybe somebody else can attest to this, but I've heard rumblings about the idea of a conservancy for the actual park itself. And, um, and you know, that's the sort of thing where if there's a conservancy that you can kind of address these sort of issues, you can't put a door on the back of Lafayette Tower West, but you, um, you know, so, like, you can kind of assess how are people using it and, and rethink the, the park that way. Because I certainly mm -hmm. think that that's, that's much more easily accomplished than trying to do something like, uh, um, you know, opening up more uh, ways to get uh, up to Gratiot and to the Eastern Market and everything like that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, well, I, I have just one, one, more, one more thing to say. Read this book. <laughs> Buy excellent. this book. I believe it's on sale, and it's a wonderful. It's, it's a an wonderful book. And I want to uh, say this yeah. about the book. So many times when you have seen uh, 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 books and periodicals that address Mies van der Rohe's work at all, they are all from the architectural point of view, basically, and, and the technical aspects of, uh, of Mies van der Rohe. Uh, this book concentrates on the people and how we actually live, which is very significant. Because for me, uh, what it really means is that I am not invisible. <laughs> I am not yeah. invisible. And if I am not invisible, that means that this book represents a breakthrough in Detroit not being invisible in many uh, design circles and architectural circles throughout the world. Because this book is dealing with the human matter of Lafayette Park. Okay, thank you very much. I, I also, very good. I just wanted to say quickly that um, the book is also for sale at Source Booksellers on Cass and uh, Willis, and, and here, and a book beat in, book beat in Oak Park. But, but thanks everybody for coming. Of course, I missed that because I was talking. What? Just that it's at Source Booksellers. Oh, okay.